Each year in this country, there are over 80,000 serious workplace fires that are reported. That equates to four fires per day in every state. I can tell you that working for a company that maintains over 100,000 fire extinguishers every year, that reported figure is low. The truth is, we simply don't know how many fires are prevented by the proper use of a fire extinguisher. Most companies do not report fires that are extinguished by an extinguisher. They simply clean the mess up and they go about their business. The U.S. has one of the highest fire death rates in the industrialized world. I was shocked to hear that. With all this training, all this technology, and all this infrastructure, how can we be so high? I've come to find that in the U.S., we have become complacent about fire. Each year, fire kills more Americans than all natural disasters combined. That is more than hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and earthquakes. Add them all up, and fire is still more. Fire is the third leading cause of accidental death in the home. And there are about 1.5 million fires that are reported each year in this country. But keep in mind, not all fires are reported. Fire can double in size every minute. I repeat, fire can double in size every minute. They can be fully involved in 15 minutes. And 90% of all 911 fire-related response times are under 11 minutes. That's according to Homeland Security. Now, we're not talking about using a fire extinguisher at this point. Fire extinguishers were not designed to fight fires at this stage. They were designed to help you in the first minute of the incipient stage. According to the National Fire Protection Association, fire extinguishers are required inside of publicly occupied buildings for the protection of the building and its occupants. They were placed there for your protection in the event that you needed to use the extinguisher to get out. Defend yourself in a position until help arrives or extinguish somebody who is on fire. OSHA requires employees to know how to use a fire extinguisher when fire extinguishers have been provided in the workplace for its employees. Not by the employer, but by local and state fire codes. You must also provide them with the necessary training for incipient stage fires. Just because you need to know how to use a fire extinguisher, does that mean you have to in the event that there is a fire? Yes or no? The answer is no. You do not have to use the fire extinguisher. It's important that you know how to use it, but you're not required to use it in the event that there is a workplace fire. So the protocol for this is called fight or flight. And fight or flight is simply this. In the event that we find ourselves in a situation where there is a fire, you can either choose to use the extinguisher or you can choose to get out. Under the fight or flight protocol, you need to yell the word fire. You pull the building fire alarm, you call 911, and you head for your nearest exit. We have been practicing this safety procedure since kindergarten. From kindergarten all the way through our college years, we have been taught to evacuate when we hear a fire alarm. In every one of those fire drills, we have a liaison stand up and tell us to follow them and they'll lead us to safety and remind us how we should behave during this fire drill. The problem with this drill is that when people are faced with a real life fire situation, they're looking for direction and counsel from someone in charge. Unfortunately, we typically do not have that person and people begin to panic and go into the state of denial. My point is, if you're gonna take flight, do so quickly. Do not wait for someone's instruction. If you choose to fight the fire, you need to follow the same safety protocol as flight. We need to yell the word fire, pull the building fire alarm, and call 911, and make sure that we are still able to get out ourselves. Once we have established that, and the fire department is on its way, and we're able to get out, we can assess the situation by asking ourselves a few questions. Is this an incipient stage fire? Which classification of fire is that? Is this the right size and type fire extinguisher? Is it charged? And do I know how to use this extinguisher? Once you have answered those questions, discharge the fire extinguisher on the fire in the 15 to 20 seconds with the hopes that you will extinguish it in five to eight seconds. Once the extinguisher is empty or the fire is out, put it down, get out, and stay out. 
Now I prefer this safety protocol over other methods because the empty extinguisher gives us a very definitive ending point. We could be taught early on that when the extinguisher is empty at that 20 second mark, we have to get out. In my opinion, people would be spending a lot less time trying to fight a fire by other means and putting their life at risk by staying inside too long. Everything that we've ever learned about firefighting was a technique that I call over-the-top training. Most likely, one of the first fires that you were taught to fight was a campfire in your own backyard. You were given a garden hose and told to spray the hose over the top of the fire. If you were in the military, the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, and you were out in the field without water, you were given a shovel and told to throw dirt over the top of the fire. If you had a pan fire in your kitchen, and you were told that you could put a lid or a wet towel over the top of the fire to put it out. If someone was on fire, we were told to smother them by throwing something over the top of them. Because of this early conditioning of over-the-top firefighting, people were unable to use the extinguisher properly. Fire extinguishers needed to be used at the base of the fire. In 1996, my wife and I bought our first home together. We moved in in August, and on October 31st, on Halloween night, we had been given a pumpkin with a candle in the center. We put the candle on the mantel between the kitchen and the living room. We lit it and we went downstairs and left it unattended. And as we dealt with all the little trick-or-treaters that came to the door, we were unaware that there was a fire going on upstairs. The next thing we knew, the next door neighbor called to say, David, I'm looking through your picture window and I believe that your living room couch is on fire. Well, fire can cause excitement, and excitement can cause adrenaline, and adrenaline in large doses can cause confusion. And in this confused state, I began running around the house yelling the word fire. I ran upstairs, and sure enough, there is my couch in a complete blaze. I immediately ran to the kitchen sink, and I started to fill a pan with water. And as I'm slowly watching this pan fill up with water, I remember thinking, this is a huge waste of my time. I shut the water off, and the next thing that popped into my head was a fire extinguisher. I ran downstairs as quickly as possible looking for my fire extinguisher and I found it on a bracket in a two by four stud in the furnace room. I grabbed the fire extinguisher trying to take it out of the bracket but in my confused state I was unable to calm myself down enough to take it out of the bracket. I twisted, I pulled, I yanked and the fire extinguisher came free along with the bracket and a chunk of the two by four. I went running back upstairs to the fire and I went to pull the pull pin on the fire extinguisher and in this adrenalized state, I was unable to pull it out. I twisted, I pulled, somehow the fire extinguisher pin came free. I squeezed the valve assembly and aimed it towards the couch. However, nothing came out. The fire extinguisher had no service pressure in it and this is a very common story. The house was built in 1980, this was 1996 that fire extinguisher should have never been in that home in the first place. Luckily, the next door neighbor, the one that called to tell me that my upstairs living room couch was on fire, came running in through the front door in this moment and he handed me a 20 pound ABC dry chemical fire extinguisher. Knowing what I know now, it was the only fire extinguisher large enough to put out a fire this size. I grabbed the extinguisher, I discharged it on the couch in its entirety, and the fire went out. I then placed the fire extinguisher down at the front door, I closed the door, went out on the front lawn, and I waited on the front lawn with my wife until the fire department arrived. Now, according to Homeland Security, the average response time is 11 minutes, but that was not the case on Halloween night. It was 45 minutes before the first fire truck arrived on scene because of all of those little trick-or-treaters that were in the road. Luckily, the fire extinguisher did its job. It secured the fire until the fire department did arrive and we ended up saving the home. So I'll ask you, how many of you have had the chance to put out a fire? The reality is, every one of us has fought a live fire before. Anyone who's ever blown out a birthday candle has successfully fought a fire. The reason I say that is, fire is a chemical reaction. The definition of fire is a self-sustaining process of a rapid oxidation of a fuel that produces heat and light. It's a self-sustaining as long as it has all of the elements that make up fire. The elements that make up fire are heat, fuel, oxygen, 
and the chemical reaction also known as the tetrahedron. In order to fight fire, you must interrupt one or more of the elements in the tetrahedron to successfully put the fire out. If we go back to our birthday candle analogy, we can understand how this theory works. By blowing on the candle, we cool the fire down and remove the heat. By putting the candle in a jar, we remove the oxygen. By letting the candle burn itself out, we removed the fuel source. To understand how fire extinguishers work, you can throw a handful of baking soda at the fire and interrupt the chain reaction. This is why it's so important to teach people how and where to aim the extinguishers. There are five classifications of fire. Class A, which consists of wood, cardboard, paper, things otherwise known as common combustibles. Class A fires can be deep-seated when they burn and can be difficult to put out because of the embers. This classification requires securement. Most agents are effective in knocking down the flames in a class fire. However, only the agents that have been given the Class A rating can secure the fire from reigniting. Class B fires are flammable liquids such as gas, oils, gases, polar solvents. Class B fires can reach maximum intensity very rapidly. Therefore, rapid extinguishment is required. These types of fires do not require securement as long as the heat source has been removed. Class C fires are electrically energized equipment. It's critical that the electricity is turned off before anyone attempts to fight this type of fire. Class D is a flammable metal. Yes, metal burns. Metal burns extremely hot and can produce its own oxygen as it's burning. This classification requires knowledge of the metal and the extinguisher before ever attempting to fight the fire. Selecting the wrong extinguisher on a Class D fire could result in an explosion. Firefighters have been injured, even killed, by arriving on scene to car fires constructed with magnesium. This is why we teach our students flight if you're unable to identify the class of fire. The last classification is Class K, animal fats, cooking oils, and greases. This classification is also one of the first fires that we were taught as children that needed to be handled differently. I also believe that this class of fire also has helped condition us to fight fire the wrong technique. If our parents were cooking grease on a stovetop, we were asked by our parents, if this catches on fire, don't do what? Most likely it was, don't throw water on the fire. What we were told we could do, we could put a lid on it, cover it with something, throw a wet towel over it, sprinkle salt or baking soda over the top. All of those methods were consistent with the over-the-top method we talked about earlier. In all of my years of instructing, I have never heard anyone tell me that they were instructed by their mom to go to the pantry, get the foam fire extinguisher out, discharge it from a safe distance, shut the burner off, call the fire department, and get out of the house, ever. So consequently, when we are faced with a fire, whether it's at work or at home, we attempt to put the fire out using everything that we have been conditioned to do and rarely remember to think of a fire extinguisher. Now, people in this country are buying turkey fryers and they're putting three gallons of cooking oil in this LP gas heated fryolator. And where are people placing them? In the garage, on the porch, on the deck, against the side of the house, and on the three season sunroom porch. When these babies catch on fire, the flames can be up to 15 feet high and they can have a splash area outside of the unit up to six feet. Putting a lid on it is not an option. Sprinkling baking soda will not work. And grabbing the little extinguisher you have in your basement is usually not effective in extinguishing this type of fire. This classification received its own designation because of the environment it was used in. Restaurants were heating this fuel up to high temperatures in insulated commercial cooking equipment. Once the oil would catch fire, it was possible to extinguish, however, it was difficult to keep it from reigniting. NFPA recognized that this fire was similar to a Class A fire in terms of its need for securement after extinguishing. The best type of fire extinguisher for this type of fire is a K-Class fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers come in many shapes and sizes. The things you need to look for is the classification of fire the fire extinguisher is approved for. 
You can tell by looking at the symbols on the front label. The other thing we would want to look at is the gauge. This will tell us if the extinguisher is charged and ready for use. When we look at the back or side of the extinguisher, we can see the Underwriters Laboratories Manifest, otherwise known as the UL listing. This label tells us what the extinguisher is rated for. It basically tells us the size of fire it's been approved for. There are many different types of extinguishers. The one hanging in the wall in your place of business depends entirely on the type of business you are in. Most offices have this one, a dry chemical which can be used for Class A, B, and C fires. The method in which we use a fire extinguisher is called PASS. PASS is an acronym for Pull, Aim, Squeeze, and Sweep. Although this sounds simple enough, the majority of the people that I see fail using an extinguisher typically fail in one of these four categories. Pull, the first failure that is common in trying to pull the pull pin. Most people are unable to pull the pin out because they are most likely in a panic situation. They are squeezing the handle and pinching the pin. The proper way to pull a pin is by holding the extinguisher in your hand, turning it like a car key, and sliding it out and dropping it on the ground. Aim. Remember, we are interrupting a chemical reaction. We need to aim the fire extinguisher at the source of that reaction, otherwise known as at the base. Squeeze. Squeeze the handle until the fire is out or the extinguisher is empty. Sweep. We have to sweep the fire from a safe distance of about eight feet, the entire base of that fire. Out of all of the steps and pass, experience has shown me that this one requires the most amount of training. After the extinguisher has been discharged, put the extinguisher down and back away from the fire, get out and stay out. It is unsafe to stay inside of the building. The room is very unsafe air quality at this point and your visibility will most likely be obstructed. Your career as a firefighter is over in 20 seconds and our fight or flight decision has given us a very definitive ending point. During a recent study group I participated in, a group of safety professionals were asked to offer their opinions on the tragic Station Nightclub fire in Warwick, Rhode Island. On February 20th of 2003, 100 lives were lost in what would result in the third deadliest nightclub fire on American soil. How could this type of tragedy happen today with all of this required fire protection, training, and code enforcement? Although there were many mistakes made in this fire, and there was plenty of blame to go around, I couldn't help but look at one photo that captured the real failure, everyone's indecision to fight or flight. In this scene, captured at 40 seconds after the fire started, we could see 10 people, including the person taking the picture, behaving as though they are in a state of denial about the seriousness of this fire. Not all of the people in this photo made it out alive that night. The lead guitarist died in this fire. Some of those behaviors include lighting a cigarette, moving band equipment away from the flames and adjusting a camera. And in a manner that is consistent with somebody in a state of shock, we could see some people just standing on stage looking at the fire. According to some accounts by witnesses and from review of the video footage, the only attempt I have seen to fight the fire was when a bottle of water was thrown at the fire at around 30 seconds in. If we look at this fire from the fight or flight perspective, we can see the failure in people's decision to act quickly. 40 seconds is a long time when dealing with an incipient stage fire. In our opinion, the owners of the bar had a responsibility to provide their employees with an emergency evacuation plan. That plan should have included evacuating the patrons as well as instructing them on how to use a fire extinguisher. We know from the investigation that fire extinguishers were located inside of the club. The staff could have been trained to grab the extinguisher very quickly, discharge them on the fire, not 40 seconds or a minute later, Instead, the conditioned response should have been deliberate and swift. It was possible to put that fire out at the incipient stage if somebody had just used one of these.